Good. Okay. Dini Miller, welcome to Talking Pest Management. Glad to have you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. <laughs> Dini, uh, can you do us a favor and introduce yourself to, to the people listening and watching the show? Sure. Um, you know, my name is Dini Miller, and I'm a professor at Virginia Tech, and I am the urban pest management specialist. So that means I specialize, I'm in the Department of Entomology, so I study bugs. But as urban pest management, that means I specialize in insects that get in the house and also that are structural pests. So if you'd have told me 25 years ago that my life was going to be about bed bugs and cockroaches, I would have told you you were out of your mind. But <laughs> as it turns out, what's taking up the majority of my time are bed bugs and German cockroaches. But I also cover termites that eat the wood eat structures in homes and also many different ant species and pretty much anything that gets in the house these days. And I've been at Virginia Tech now for 21 years. I would have never dreamed that that was the case. <laughs> but bed bugs do run my life now, but German cockroaches are my first love. So I did my master's <laughs> and PhD in German cockroaches. As a German, I am very supportive of that. <laughs> 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 well, I'm sorry to inform you, but the German cockroach is really from Asia and Africa. I know, so yeah, I know. The German cockroach, I guess because people didn't like them at a certain point. I know, why they're are we always the bad guys? <laughs> I know, right? I know. Well, we have the American cockroach now that's not from the United States either. It you know, true. you know yeah. Americans, we have to have a bigger cockroach oh, yeah. than the German. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> if you look at our little Volkswagens and you look at your trucks that you have over there, it's definitely, there is some parallelism, I guess, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. Americans always like to have big things for some mm. reason. <laughs> true. Anyways, Dini, you, you are very into IPM. But you have a new interpretation also of IPM. I'm we're very fascinated about IPM here in Europe too. So uh, please elaborate a little bit about what is it. Okay. Well, here's the thing about integrated pest management. Um, it was developed in the 1970s for agriculture. Okay. And the reason was is after World War II, um, DDT was applied on all agricultural crops on a regular basis. And then something happened. All of a sudden, DDT wasn't killing the pests anymore because these pests had developed resistance. So that means that DDT had killed all of the pests that were susceptible to DDT. And what was left were these genetic mutants. Okay. And so the population had literally changed. But not only that, because the farmers had used it over and over, they'd also killed their natural enemies. And we find out in the 1960s when Rachel Carson writes her book, Silent Spring, that we've also contaminated the environment. So in the 1970s, farmers got smart and decided that they would go out and look at their crops instead of just applying pesticides on a calendar-based basis. They would go out and look at their crops and go, hey, If I count these pests, do I have enough pests that it makes economic sense mm -hmm. for me to apply a pesticide so I don't have damage to my crop come harvest mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. Or are there so few pests that I won't need to apply pesticide mm -hmm. and I'll still be fine? So originally, integrated pest management was designed with the idea of reducing resistance to pesticide. It wasn't this non-toxic toxic methodology that we talk about today. Now, here's the thing. The urban arena, which also deals with insects, kind of took integrated pest management and pasted it onto the urban environment, but it wasn't exactly the same thing. Okay, the idea for farmers was reducing the pests to a manageable level so they don't lose money. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a manageable level of bed bugs in your mother's opinion? Okay, Zero. <laughs> most people don't want a single yeah. insect inside their home. That's considered unacceptable. So the IPM idea, integrated pest management, which makes it sound like we use a bunch of different techniques integrated together mm -hmm. to get rid of our insect problems, True. has kind of developed this non-toxicity or low toxicity idea 
in the urban environment. But that wasn't originally what the idea was about. It was about managing pesticide resistance. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've discovered consistently, when I am talking to people who are not in the pest control industry about integrated pest management, they think it's this non-toxic method, but they really don't know anything about integrated pest management. And one of the things that's very important in integrated pest management in agriculture is going out there and assessing the number of pests to begin with. How many are we talking about? Because that makes our decision as to what we do about them. You know, if you have two bed bugs, you don't Mm -hmm. use the same treatment that you use for 2,000. Absolutely. Okay. But that part has been completely lost Mm -hmm. in the urban environment. You talk to anybody about, are you going out there and scouting and counting the number of bugs? No, we have bed bug dogs. And they, if they find one, they signal a positive, you know? Gotcha. So I'm looking at changing that terminology Mm -hmm. to assessment based pest management, not Mm -hmm. because it's any different from integrated pest management, but just so our clients who don't know anything about integrated pest management, realize something's going to be assessed. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that we have in the United States, and this is what my goal in life, okay, going forward is, is that in low-income housing that is government subsidized in the United States, we have so many German cockroaches, I can go into somebody's apartment and catch in a sticky trap well, three sticky traps, really, 1,600 cockroaches in a single night. No way. Yes. (laughs) And these are under contract. They're paying for pest control. Our tax dollars are paying for pest control. Now, are they getting pest control for their money? Not a bit. What they're getting is somebody who is getting paid so little that they have enough time to go in there and spray some stuff Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the managers of these apartments, what is your company spraying? They can't tell you. So I always ask them, are they spraying diet Coca-Cola? You know, how would you know? But they go in there for about two minutes, spray some stuff and come back out. And we don't know if any of the cockroaches are dead. And if the resident complains because they're low income, government subsidized, and they say, oh my goodness, I have a zillion cockroaches, then typically the response has been the last 30 years. Well, that's because you don't clean enough. Your apartment isn't clean. And I've got all kinds of data for our research that we have done now in public housing, just using baiting as the only technique that whether the resident cleans or not is irrelevant. But... A lot of people will say in the United States that IPM, the foundation for indoor IPM, is resident sanitation. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, you know, unless your mother sits there and teaches you how to do dishes or how to clean behind the stove, you know, then you don't necessarily do that with any regularity. Mm -hmm. And trying to change human habits I've been working with humans for a long time. And let me tell you, it's easier to get the pests to change their habits than it is for the humans. You know? (laughs) Yeah, I agree. So I kind of want to take, I want to attempt taking the human behavior out Mm. of the picture. Gotcha. Because I have enough data to show that we can get rid of the pests anyway. But for 30 years, at least in my career, you know, human behavior has been used as the excuse mm-hmm. on why integrated pest management is not successful in a lot of mm-hmm. these environments, when in fact, it has more to do with the number of minutes that the contractor has to go in there and take care of the pest. <laughs> I agree with you on that one. Mm. You know, conflict so of interest here, right? A complicated situation, many it human is. layers. And pillars, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. That is really interesting and fascinating to me because you are right, and I fully agree that if anybody thinks about we're doing IPM pest control, we even call ourselves IPM pest control, Miller or whoever, um, then people think, oh, they're more sustainable and um, they look at using less toxins. And in one way, it's true. But on the other side, that terminology is probably um, 
misinterpreted or it is, it's, it's too high valued because if you don't do risk assessment and risk analysis, uh, uh, analysis and uh, henceforth, uh, an IPM method is, you know, what is it really? So you're, what you're saying is um, next to IPM is good and the application of IPM onto urban environments was done, um, you know, with a good purpose in mind. But on the other hand, it doesn't give us anything much if we do not do a proper assessment beforehand and and throughout the, the process, right? Did right. I get it right? And really what we should be doing for whoever's paying for this is going in there, assessing the population, giving them some numbers. And then we, we go in there and do a treatment, whatever yeah. we decide to use, to be able to give them numbers afterwards to show yeah. that we have fewer pests. Yeah, fully agree. Before. Fully agree. And not use that excuse, oh, we have the same number or we have more because it's mm. the middle of summer and say, oh, well, it's the resident's fault. Mm. You know, we're not helpless. We have the power oh, yeah. to get rid of these pests indoors. But it mm. takes time and persistence. And everybody out there thinks instead we have some sort of magic non-toxic spray yeah yeah. and we're just choosing not to use it well that's <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> yeah i totally agree with you i mean in in germany uh, for instance to give a, an example that's very uh, near to me is um in the, in the food industry obviously food industry they pay money in uh, in low income housing right. they do not spend money but in, in the food industry um, there's uh, most of the food companies are certified by standard. You have American Institute of Baking, AIB. We have also AIB, but we also have IFS, International Featured Standard, which is like the German AIB, basically. And um, in IFS, it's, if, if it says, before doing pest control, you should do and regularly do and perform a proper risk analysis. And the risk analysis basically looks at all the various spots and locations in a company or let's say in your apartment then. And it, and it basically has a graph and, it, and the graph basically um, uh, uh, compares the probability of a pest occurring. And um, so from zero to 100 in external areas, pests live. So it's, it's high probability uh, in the midst of a production site, it's lower, let's say 10%. And then you have the Y graph, which is basically uh, standing for how hard would the damage be? And what impact would it have? Like mm -hmm. zero, let's say, outdoors it has zero impact they fly around they can be happy there rodents can live there all good but in the production side it's very high and we cut it into like like pillars um and then we we determine where to put an, an x for the warehouse or an x for outdoors an x for the production side and we do that regularly and through ipm so sealing hygiene and proofing we we try to minimize risks um occurrence entering etc um is, is that part of what what you what you mean describe well it's a little bit different because mm -hmm. you know again that ipm has been generalized from row crops to industry and food production mm -hmm. to okay. restaurants and then to people's homes and you must admit that there's different elements, different factors that we need to take into consideration 100%. in each of those environments. 100%. And so, you know, using a generalized term like integrated pest management, yes, that makes it easy on humans that we just have one term. <laughs> but, you know, we really have to be able to define what integrated pest management is going to look like in these mm -hmm. different environments. Mm-hmm. And trying to generalize, okay, well, this is going to be non-toxic to children and pets and stuff like that. Well, yes, of course. And in the United States, our pesticides, the pesticides that we are allowed to use indoors are so regulated due to the Food Quality Protection yep. Act of 1996 that we can't expect to have anything that's going to be dangerous used indoors because they're not allowed to have anything that has the... Um, any kind of observable effects. Gotcha. So they test pesticides before they're ever registered to make sure that they know the no observable effect level. Mm -hmm. 
So, but I think also in an environment, let's say you have a warehouse situation where really exclusion is very important. How do we mm. keep the pests from coming in? That's a Agreed. little bit different than working in a restaurant or working in somebody's apartment. Absolutely. I mean, how do you want to exclude a lot in an apartment? It's way, yeah, you know, you don't have, um, I mean, in a warehouse, obviously you have large open doors, you, you don't have fly nets or any of these sort of things. So yeah, it's, it's, it's different. So what you're saying is basically we need to, um, in the end, every situation is different. Probably every apartment is different too, but um, there, it, I mean, indeed there are various um, application themes that we cannot apply onto an apartment, whereas we could apply it onto, let's say a warehouse again. Right. So we need to have different categories on, assessment and um and operational ipm is that right right? and the thing is is you think about it in a warehouse Mm. where everybody's an employee you have a lot of control over the human behavior right Mm. as well but then you get into individual people's homes where i focus on you have no control of human behavior And trying to use that as an excuse for your lack of success, you know, we just need to think about it differently and approach it differently as if Mm -hmm. the humans were not a factor. But as you say, in the food uh, production industry and things like that, you have a lot more that you can control. Mm -hmm. And IPM, in my opinion, is more appropriate for that environment than going into somebody's apartment and saying, oh, yes, well, based on human sanitation and they they're they're going to have to cooperate with us or it's never going to mm. work you know it's mm. like just dismissing our ability to take care of the problem yeah you know? agreed so how do we tackle uh, the problem for these low-income houses that a pest manager um, comes in and sprays something unidentifiable that uh, in the end is a toxic or a cooked diet or, or whatever how do we well Here's the thing is there isn't anything that you, you're allowed to apply that would be a toxicant, okay? Mm. And most of the products that we are allowed to use indoors that can be sprayed anymore are over 50 years old, Whoa. okay? And these are pyrethroid <sighs> chemistries that have very, very low effects on mammals to begin with. And you got to think about it. Cockroach is this big. Yeah. So it can only take certain exposure, which somebody my size can take a lot Mm. more. And pyrethroids really don't have big effects on mammals, right? But the problem with using these products that are 50 years old is, again, we have killed all of the cockroaches that are susceptible to these products. And what we have left Uh are those that are not. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. We've killed all the genetic susceptible ones, Uh and we have even selected for, through natural selection, unnatural selection in this case, (laughs) those cockroaches that have thicker skins, where the outer cuticle Mm -hmm. is thicker. So if you think you can apply something today and those pesticide residues are going to work for you tomorrow, they don't. The cockroaches can just walk across it and not pick up a lethal dose. So what's with gel? Huh? Why don't people use gel? Because they seem to be fairly effective. The gel bait formulations, one of the reasons that they're not used in public housing, and let me explain this. So I'm going to have to talk in American dollars. I'm sorry about this. Let's say you have 458 apartment units. Mm. And our U.S. HUD, okay, our government agency, puts out a request for bids for pest Mm. control. And one company comes in and says, okay, I can do those 458 units for $5,000. And another one comes in and says, I can do it for $4,000. And another one comes in and says, we can do it for $2,748. So HUD goes with them. But if you take those 458 units and divide it into that $2,478, that's $6 a door. That's like a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the cost of a pack of cigarettes. And that doesn't leave the technician any time. It takes an average of 49 seconds. We timed it to get in the door. Knock, knock, knock. Wait, wait, wait. Knock, knock, knock. Wait, wait, wait. And finally, somebody answers, you know, can we come in? Okay, come in. And then he only has a very small amount of time if he's going to make any profit Mm, on that unit. 
So let's say he only spends two or three minutes in there. The amount of time it would require for him to apply enough of those gel baits, okay, the way that we apply them in yeah. those little quarter dime size things, <clears throat> he doesn't have enough time to do that. So what he's going to do and what the <laughs> resident would expect also, is that he's going to spray. He'll spray in back of the refrigerator. He'll spray yes. in back of the sink. He'll spray in back of the toilet. And Absolutely. then out and on to the next. But those roaches have seen that spray five <laughs> zillion times. Yep. And they're like, bring it on. You can take all the spray you got. <laughs> and that's the thing. You know, this is what we see in the United States is our problem. Because they're getting paid so little, they can't come in and do pest control. Mm, gotcha. They can only afford to come in and do pesticide application. Mm, okay. That's not pest control. That's pesticide mm. application. Mm. And nobody ever asked, are there fewer cockroaches after you did the spraying than there were before? Mm. And during the summer, we see these populations double, triple, quadruple mm. and if anybody complains it's like well you didn't clean up that's why <laughs> so so we're it's it's financial issues in the end um yes we we yes. have a contradiction a contradiction here or we have a conflict of interest right i mean a pest control business is to blame partly um but partly because you know obviously they need to make money They need to make money to have capex to invest to pay a loan, you know, loans to their employees. So, are they really to blame? Um, but um, you know, this this whole model. Um, my pest, my parents even worked in pest control, so um, it's it's like 45 years that we could look back, and I, I still know that from back in the days, pricing for some clients every five years or something when they did a new quotation went down and down and down because the metrics, if you don't have a problem or you don't care about the problem, you take the cheapest. So um, how do we overcome that? Um, what, what is the end? Uh, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Well, what I'm like you were talking about a little bit earlier, I'm looking at pest control, trying to improve its image as a profession. Mm -hmm. Okay. Imagine yep. if a plumber came to your home mm -hmm. because your toilet wasn't working. And when they left, the toilet was still not working. Mm. And when you called to complain, they said, well, you keep pooping in the toilet. What can we do about that? Okay. And that's kind of the situation. I understand. You know, our mm -hmm. pest control technicians have to be trained in the safety and use of certain pesticides, mm -hmm. what kind of protective equipment they have to wear, where they can apply it, where they can't. So they have to be certified annually in all of these hours of training. So they are trained professionals, mm -hmm. and yet they don't seem to carry the same image of professionalism that we see with plumbers or electricians, mm -hmm. things like that. And I wonder why that is. And one of the things, too, that I run into typically is I'll go into an apartment. <clears throat> and even though they have a pest control contractor, the apartment resident will have a bunch of cans of pesticide spray, six or eight. Mm -hmm. And they believe that they can do just as good <clears throat> a job as the pest control operator because they believe that the ability to uh, get rid of the cockroaches is mm. in the can. Not gotcha. the human. Gotcha. Not human intelligence. This is some miracle formulation mm. here that if I spray that, it kills everything. And we need to change the image. You know, um, our pest control operators have been using for bed bugs and things heat. We've been using freezing. We've been using baits. And yet the public image of this industry is still spray. Now, how do Absolutely. we get rid of that look? Yeah. And how? one of the things that we typically show, I just saw this, the National Pest Management Association has mm. put together a video and here's this tall white guy in a white outfit out walking around outside a big white house with a little blonde girl who's following him around going, ew, ew, ew. Every time he shows her a place where an insect can get in the house. But, you know, a lot of our work that pest control operators do is going into 
homes that are owned by elderly people that are covered in hundreds of thousands of cockroaches or bed bugs. I'm like, why aren't we showing these individuals going in and their ability to tackle a problem of that magnitude without just being, oh, we just go and spray. But the image has been kind of this white house with the white, you mm. know, blonde lady and everything. Like pest control is some sort of luxury treatment. Mm, really? You know, that you, oh, I want to keep the pests from coming in. Well, that's not the problem we have. We have a lot of German roaches and bed bugs that only live indoors. Mm. So I think it's time in 2020, for heaven's sakes, mm. that we start to change the image of the pest control industry and show them as professionals and also get away from allowing salespeople who maybe worked for pharmaceutical companies last week mm. and now are selling pest control this week to go and sell something so low at such a low price, mm. but they make their month because it was 4,000 oh, units. And yet you leave true. this technician who has no choice, but to get in and out yeah, of there. No, yeah. yeah, you're right. And the reason I also want to change the name to assessment-based pest management in the urban environment is to let our customers know that something needs to be assessed. And if you go in and assess mm. it and sit down with the customer and say, well, here's your problem. You got a million <clears throat> zillion cockroaches in here. And here's how many minutes we need to spend in each unit to do something effective so that our customers understand what they get for their money. So mm. they would look at it and go $5 a door. That's ridiculous. And that's what we need to change. We need people to know more about our industry. And I think we need to show the range of problems that we have out there and our education requirements. Mm. But I don't think we've done a very good job of that. You know? Agreed. So first, first of all, I can, I can, I would sign that immediately. I mean, amen, really. But um, I, I really see there are obviously education Um I'm trying to do that with you interviewing you right now. <laughs> so I'm hoping many, many people see this. So make sure we, we spread it, spread the word. Um, what I see is we have an industry that is large. We turn around 20 billion per year, um, especially in the US with the largest market or, you know, after the Asian markets. Um, it is going to trickle down really, really slowly, right? So... This is also why I've, you know, we, we've been creating disruptive solutions, if you will. Um, we, we said we had the issue of resistance in Germany of uh, rodenticides, anticoagulants, some of them. And we yeah. have seen that it don't work anymore. And then we've also seen, you know, some uh, uh, bakeries or baby food manufacturers don't want them anymore. So we had the same kind of, we came from the same situation of resistance. And then we made something new, but it takes ages to um, give people, let's say, for instance, a digital trap and um, give them the opportunity of, of 24-7 surveillance, et cetera, because in the end, it is way more uh, uh, expensive for sure. Um, if, if you offer a service, as you said, for six euros or six dollars, or let it be 20, and uh, you mean you can compare it to a new form of pest management, which you have described and which I also stand for, um, which does apply. We have our friends and, and, and companies that we know very well that um, offer brilliant uh, assessment-based pest control and management and offer only these to, pest, uh, to clients of that need service. And they have educated sales staff that wouldn't sell at the lowest price, etc. But let's say they're below 10%. Um, are we on the right route? Um, do you just think it's going to take time And what else can we do to speed that process up in, I mean, in favor of our industry? Well, um, I do have a couple of ideas. Is <laughs> First of all, we've got to get that message out there to our, our clients that time is money. Now, everybody yeah. understands that. Everybody understands that. Yep. But... One of the things that we need to do is meet with multi-unit housing facilities and what mm. have you and say, okay, you know, if you pay five, you should look at the total they're saying that you're going to need to pay and divide it by the number of doors and then calculate those minutes. And if you don't do it, you are stupid. 
<laughs> and that's the language that I use okay, when I'm gotcha. doing training for apartment management. Yeah, it is I'm true. Like, You're not looking at that. And then asking yourself, you know, I say this to apartment managers, you should ask yourself, you know, what are you getting for your five dollars you mean common sense you think you're gonna get rid use, of pets. exactly use your common sense people right yes yes mm. and we should price pest control at what it actually costs to control pets not just spray some stuff mm. you know and i have some you know i've been preaching this quite a bit and there are some companies that have decided that they would offer different things to different multi-unit facilities okay All here's right. our basis here's the spray and pray cost mm. here's the cost for actually getting rid of the problem and here's the cost for going in there assessing taking different approaches <clears throat> and what it's going to take mm -hmm. and interestingly this one particular company called smart pest solutions in arizona has had very good success with this yeah, because once right. they started talking to their clients about what they got for their money mm -hmm. that made sense to these managers but up until now Most people don't want to talk about cockroaches and bed bugs, so they're just like, oh, the cost of our service is this, the cost yeah. of our service is that. And nobody says what the service actually is. Includes, yeah. Could you imagine taking your car to the, um, because it's making a strange noise, and then they give you a bill after the garage fixes your car and never tells you what was wrong with it? Yeah, agreed. You know? Yeah. And so I think we need to get, and also advertising, I think we need to show people what we actually do mm. and not just have this pretty image of, you know, but I hear from marketing people on a regular basis, oh, well, people don't want to look at insects. I'm like, mm. yes, but there's a reason that horror movies are so popular. Maybe <laughs> we should... Put that <laughs> That's a very clever comparison, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's very clever. You know, that we could actually show people the, the reality of what we deal with, what we're trained mm. to deal with, and make it look like we actually have value. Because, again, right now, most of the residents I talk to believe they can do just as well as the pest control company because they have their can of spray. Mm. So I was about to ask... Um, what can we do and i mean in the end I'm, i'm always thinking what what other solutions are there and i fully agree with you money is one of the drivers right so um what if let's say these old over 50 years old sprays would be forbidden this would obviously mean that you know everybody were to take gel more people took gel and gel could uh, could go down in price or prices generally move upwards for low-income housing jobs etc I mean, I really see it, it's really hard for an incremental change of pest controllers of, of businesses because they're in the spinning wheel and always in this contradiction of we need to earn money. We need to take that contract because I want to pay wages, etc. So it's, it's a conflict of interest. Um, is, isn't, shouldn't somebody else, let's say, legal circumstances, etc., step into... Um, Uh, the environment of pest management say we're going to take your toys away now you have just have the the good toys i mean the old toys would be well as well if we weren't overusing them um and forming resistance etc right i mean do you think um you know the, the big man state or whatever have you you know uh, making laws uh, would help You know, I wish I could say from experience that it's really mm. helped us, but not particularly. Mm. You know, we need humans who are out there thinking instead of just making regulations because the pyruvate mm. insecticides do have benefits for us, especially when using for ants. Yeah. Okay. Because social insects don't have resistance because they're so genetically similar. We either kill them all or we don't kill any. Mm. So we really do need these products available and we don't want to reduce what is available to our industry to use, mm, but exactly, yeah. we need to be able to have individuals that go out there and think about the problem and getting other people aware of how to think of it too, mm. you know? And I right. think that we have done a lot to hold ourselves back mm -hmm. by not, 
letting people know more about what we actually do, you know? So you think and I do recommend, you know, that these pyrethroid insecticides, if I was watching you go and apply them, you would be wearing the mask, the long sleeves mm. and the gloves. But I don't necessarily have to because it's just not that toxic, mm. and especially formulated at 0.05 percent mm. in water, you know, but it wouldn't hurt to have residents see more of what we do. And that assessment is critical. You know, one of the things that's never done at the beginning is going Hmm. in there and surveying an account and saying, this is how many insects you have. Mm -hmm. And this is what it's going to take for Mm -hmm. us to get rid of them. Interesting. Instead, it's just like, I'll charge you $5,000. I'll charge you $3,000. I'll charge you $2,478. Now, if we went out there, and said, no, we have to do an assessment first and then come back and show photographs of the mm. cockroaches we can catch in an apartment in a single night. Mm. Believe me, that really opens people's minds. I absolutely yeah. agree with you. And I think, as I said, this, this has been part of the reasons why we started talking to professionals around the world like yourselves, because I think starting in our industry, I mean, you know, probably many people um, from the pest management industry are going to watch this, probably maybe 5% uh, low income housing of people that think, hey, how could we do better pest control in our building? So I'm thinking of spreading the word definitely makes sense. And thank you that the internet, thanks that the internet exists. So uh, we can hope that many more in- pest influences or whatever you uh, have you um, will uh, make more YouTube videos educating people. Agreed. So Dini, can I ask you something else? I mean, we, we, we talked about um, the little magic can and how, um, um, you know, people think that the chemical um, does 99.9% of the job there and not the human. But with more education through, I don't know, YouTube, uh, blogs, Instagram, Facebook, what have you, um, how about... Does it make sense? I mean, there are sites or websites that exist that are called Do Your Own Pest Management or Do Your Own Pest Control or something like that. And I th- I heard that um, their revenues are phew, that more and more yes. people's people are uh, ordering their equipment and for DIY pest control at home. Um, mm-hmm. I know that you are a very critical around it if it's the wrong product. But on the other hand, if we educate more, wouldn't that help to? to to find a solution to that problem as well i mean it's probably not the only solution but what, what do you think about that development what, I'm, I'm not sure i understand what you're saying are you saying a solution to eliminate these do your own situations Is no a you're... solution to to pass problems sorry so oh, okay lesser bed bugs lesser less less uh, german cockroaches in your apartment if people order and do the pest management right. service themselves Well, that's the thing is, you know, the advantage of being in the pest control industry is you do have some education and you need to broadcast that. That's another reason I really do not like um, pest control being sold by a salesperson and then some technician comes to do the work while the people are outside of the building. You know, there's Mm. no communication there about what the technician is actually doing. And I think it would be very beneficial for us to talk to these residents Mm -hmm. about what we do and why we do it Mm -hmm. and what we're looking at. So they get some appreciation for Mm -hmm. what kind of work we are doing here, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's amazing to me. I get a zillion people calling me in a day because I have an extension um, commitment, which 70% of my time is supposed to be, you know, answering phone calls to help your mother get rid of her bed bug problem and stuff like that. All right. You know, and a lot of the ideas that people have are just crazy. They totally don't understand what we do. And their fear of insects is astronomical. And I think, you know, they need to understand that the most important thing when somebody comes into their home is that they have a thinking, trained human being making decisions and not just applying a magical spray that mm-hmm. they can buy on do it yourself pest control and spray themselves. Gotcha. So how about, uh, let's say an online seminar or webinar, uh, for people, uh, DIY pest control, um, MPMA could look into this. Maybe, I mean, obviously MPMA is the association of uh, businesses that do pest control, uh, a proper right. pest management job, but looking at pest problems and 
not being able to manage them well and maybe a transformation that we're now looking at and the way of some pest control contracts are being operated and held, doesn't it make sense to educate people, let's say, over a um, dedicated source like accredited source like MPMA or, or something else? Oh, absolutely. And you know what? I would like to have a lot of pest control companies there too, because I promise you, yeah. a lot of them don't do a very good job Agreed. of writing their contracts or marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. And let me just cool. say, you know, in the United States, we love to sue. So litigation is a big issue. I know, yeah. And some of the things that I see out there, because um, I do as some expert witnessing and everything, is the records that are kept documenting mm. what's done in particular apartments for bed bugs in these lawsuit cases are so poor. And we have what's called the warranty of habitability in the United States. So if you own an apartment complex and there's bed bugs in your building, it's your building, <clears throat> you are 100% responsible for eliminating them, regardless of the fact that your resident brought them in. And a lot of people think, oh, well, that's unfair. Well, unfortunately, fairness doesn't really play into it because <laughs> if those people move out, those bugs are still in your building. They don't take them all with them. Yep. And so you are stuck with that situation. But we see a lot of apartment owners and managers in avoidance behavior. They may not call a pest mm. control company at all. Yep. They may call a pest control company and not even ask them what they do. <laughs> and then there's still bed bugs afterwards. And of course they yeah. say, oh, well, the resident brought them back in and stuff like that. Mm. But that's the thing <clears throat> is we need to also train these apartment managers all that right. they need to be aware of what goes on Understood. in their building so they don't get sued. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, giving people the right um, tools, basically, not only to perform a better job, but also to protect themselves a bit more and document more transparently, right? Right. Wow. And the I mean, control companies should be able to tell their, their um, customers. Hmm. Look, if you own this apartment building, this is the treatment that we need to do. And we need to document it in this particular way yeah. or else you might be up for a class action lawsuit. Hmm. We just want to let you know, you know, Interesting. and that's I mean, one way that they could protect the, the, the customer hmm. and also explain to the customer why, why they're charging mm -hmm. and what kind of work they're doing and also make some assessment. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Um, so what do we need to make it happen? I think just to, to sum up again, what I, things that I learned that I found really interesting is A, learning more about IPM and how it was brought from agriculture to urban uh, environments, that there isn't really a fit of the current perception of IPM per se, because it was designed uh, for cost effectiveness. It was designed yeah. for uh, reduction of resistance. And exactly. now we have... We have different pillars, supermarket, food industry, apartment, office building, and we need to apply, we need to make or build different strategies on IPM. So that the assessment-based PES or IPM uh, uh, strategy, I think, is, is really something that I'm definitely going to take uh, with me. It's, it's a great takeaway and learning, I think. So uh, thanks, Dini, for that, really. Yeah. Uh, I want to look more into it. And I think what really... I'm full on one page with you when it comes to educated uh, education. Um, I'm also thinking that thanks, thanks to COVID, this got speed up a bit. So a lot of people are in online seminars, etc. more. So I'm really calling for all the associations out there to, to use the momentum really, um, you know, grab the hand of the pest management industry uh, and, and, and form education. If it was, if it's an, another podcast, like what we are doing, if it's another video series, if it's a really professional way of sitting down and creating like a webinar, I know people mm -hmm. did that. Uh, the more education we have, basically the better. So um, for me, it's just left to, you know, Denny, thank you so much for your time. It's really interesting. Um, what I want to do is uh, let, let's, let's aim at 2021 uh, and do, um, let's proper revisit our industry and maybe some things that we have spotted that uh, show that there is some light at the end of a tunnel. Um, what do you think? I think that'd be great. And, you know, this wouldn't be a big change for us, mm. but... I think there's a lot of people in our industry that haven't changed the way they've done things for 50 years. Yeah. But that's why it's great to have these younger people that are coming in and really interested. It's time for a new look. 
Mm. We can totally do better than we have in Mm. the past. Mm. And I think we need to present ourselves differently than we have for the last 50 years. We're not just the spray jockey coming around to spray Mm. stuff. You know, we've got a lot of research. Yes, we've had a lot of research and we had to do to figure out what is the best way to handle these situations. And we need to get that word out. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Fully agreed. We need a, the a, a professionalism of our industry. We need to really lift up the professional pest management. It's not a pesticide applicator. This is exactly the words of, by the way, Europeans Association SEPA President Henry Mott. Uh, he's exactly calling out for exactly that. Um, so I'm pretty proud uh, about this talk because I know Henry's gonna gonna listen to this as well, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he and his team. Uh, is, is are going to bring that forward to to many of the viewers out there. So I uh, thank you for an American approach on IPM. I think it taught us a lot. Um, yeah, and, and even- really we want to push pest control, not yeah. pesticide application. We are yeah. in the pest control business. Yeah, absolutely mm-hmm. agree. Yeah, Dini Miller, thank you so much for your time. Again, we're going to write a blog about this. You can you, we, we have that as a podcast. We have it as a video interview on YouTube. Um, we're going to share it with yourself. You can share it with your friends and colleagues and peers. So let's let's bring uh, let's make sure every the word word will be spread. <laughs> awesome, that's wonderful. Yeah, let's get the word out there. We can be better. <laughs> we can, Diddy. Thank you so much. Okay, you take care. Thank you. you. Too.